it's usually the person at the helm, in our case, knows more about the depth of the water and they can see the chart. So they're kind of more making the primary decision about where to anchor. The person on the bow is there to help to look if the water's clear enough to see if water's deep enough. Also, you have a much better visibility in terms of other boats and you get a little bit better perspective, I feel like, than you do when you're back there under the bimini and the dodger, you're more protected. Um, Welcome back to Life 4.0. We're excited to release our next video in our Boat Anchoring 101 series titled Anchor Positioning and Communication. Building on our previous discussions on anchor road marking, snubbers, raising and lowering your anchor, this new video provides tips on how to determine where to anchor. Everything from positioning yourself so that you can safely swing without hitting another boat, how to read the color of the water and depth, how to manage current and wind shifts, and how to clearly communicate between the helm and the bow while anchoring. In a perfect world, we'd have an entire anchorage to ourselves to drop the hook wherever we wanted. But the reality is that if it's an attractive place, everybody else wants to be there too. So choosing a safe, comfortable position in an anchorage is a fundamental skill to have as a boater. So let's dive in. First off, you want to post a person at the bow as a spotter. It's very important for this person to be focused 100% on the task and not be distracted by the scenery or other crew members on board. It needs to be a tight team between the helm and the bow. If you're at the helm, you want to be driving slowly around the anchorage looking for a spot, calling out depths to the bow and checking the chart plotter for obstacles. While the bow person is looking for sand and both of you are checking for proper spacing with other boats. It's four meters here. Okay. It sort of seems to me like there might be some sand just off to the left. It's okay. Yeah. So I see some rocks down here, but then there's sand up ahead, maybe. Sand in this area. So that seems to be a good place to, to, to go, is right up in here. It's a little dark over there, but I can't tell. I definitely have some room here. When you have a spot in mind, drive a big circle around where you hope to drop the anchor, approximating the diameter of your swing circle. For instance, if you are in 10 meters of water, putting out a four to one scope or 40 meters of road, then drive a circle with a diameter of two times 40 or 80 meters. When it is time to drop the anchor, one of the common mistakes people make is to not take into account their boats drift downwind. It seems obvious, but it happens all the time. You want to drop the anchor upwind, or up current, whichever is stronger, the approximate length of road you will put out. The other common mistake is to drop the anchor directly upwind of another boat. You want to stagger your boat so that if you drag, you'll be less likely of hitting other boats downwind of you. Next, let's talk about swing room. A good rule of thumb is to leave at least two boat lengths between you and adjacent boats. In most cases, when a wind shift causes you to swing, the neighboring boats will swing with you. As an example of swing room, when we anchored off the shore of Amalfi, we staggered our position, but still tried to keep from swinging onto the nearby buoyed swim area. Still, it was very close and we had to keep a constant eye on our position. If you have any doubt about the depth of the water, one option is to jump into the dinghy and use a handheld depth sounder. You don't have to be completely stopped in order for one of these to work, and you'll find lots of uses for them, including checking out a narrow channel entrance as we did here in Porto Veneer or a shallow dock area. If you are still concerned, don't hesitate to jump in the water and check it out. So we are anchored in a kind of a tight spot here and Karen is going out to check what that... Okay. You'll be surprised what you find. These two boats were anchored immediately adjacent to rocks shallow enough to cause damage. When you anchor with a mix of power and sailboats and boats of different sizes, don't be surprised to see them swing differently despite the same wind and current. Power boats will respond more to wind due to their higher superstructure, while sailboats will be affected more by current due to their deeper keel. Okay, so you've set your anchor, making sure you have enough swing room. What do you do if someone else comes and anchors right up wind of you? This can be a sensitive topic with boaters. The protocol, if you can call it that with independent-minded boaters, is that the first person at the anchorage has rights. 
the newly arrived boat should move if requested. This sometimes works and, let's be honest, sometimes doesn't. Unless you fancy being laid up in a yard while trying to chase down another boater for the cost of repairs, I would suggest you take the high road and move to a safer spot. Now, what about super narrow anchorages like this Cala in Mallorca or the Calonks in France? It's risky for even one boat swinging. The answer is to find an open spot further outside and anchor in a single file type fashion. An alternative for super narrow spots is to add a stern anchor. For a while now, we have been using a lightweight aluminum fortress anchor mounted in the cockpit and easily handled from a dinghy. Another benefit of a stern anchor is the ability to hold the boat into the waves or swell when the wind would otherwise push you sideways to them and make for a rolly night's sleep. If you do choose to deploy a stern anchor, make sure everyone else is using one too, otherwise wind shifts will cause problems. So I've talked a lot about avoiding nearby boats, but you need to be on the lookout for other objects on the water and below. Fish traps and their associated buoys are a prime example. The buoys can be hard to see at first. Here's one with a simple stick inserted into a cut up piece of paddleboard. But there can be other traps whose buoys are lurking just below the surface, ready to find their way around your prop. In our home waters of Maine along the northeast coast of the United States, the anchorages are littered with small lobster buoys that keep you on your toes. You also can't assume that the seafloor is a smooth expanse of sand either. It's a good idea to take a swim to see if your anchor is caught on sunken debris. The worst case I've seen was a boater who dropped their anchor next to the buried cable providing power to the nearby island we were at. I can't say enough about swimming on your anchor to make sure everything is safe. In the end, the anchorage you want may just be too crowded and trying to force your way in will make it unsafe and hard for you to get a good night's sleep, let alone how it will affect your neighbors. In this case, it's best to just find a new spot. If you are away from the crowds, it will also give you a buffer in case high winds or a storm arrives. Now let's switch gears and talk about reading the water colors. This is a bit like the reading of tea leaves in that it is far from a science. The meaning of the colors will vary based on your region, and if the water is murky, you're out of luck completely. But there are a few general rules that will help you. First off, the lighter the color of the water, the shallower it is. The darker, the deeper it is. Light green generally means sand. Medium green can mean rock or coral. And dark green to blue or black can mean weeds. To read the colors, you need to be as high as possible off the water. Standing on the boom is a good start. Being up on the spreaders is even better. Your best timing is the middle of the day when the sun is the highest in the sky and also behind you. If it is all in front of you, the glare in the water will make it impossible to read the depth, although polarized sunglasses will help a little. I mentioned before that you want to look for sand or mud for the best anchor holding. So in other words, light green color. But be aware that you can get green colored water that looks like sand but upon closer inspection is a thin layer of loose stones over a layer of hard pan. No anchor will hold in these conditions. Yet another example of the importance of diving on your anchor. It's time now for the final topic, the use of hand signals to communicate between the helm and the bow during anchoring. Let's go back on board Sea Rose. Okay, so one thing that Karen and I do when we're anchoring is we agree on um, hand signals. And this is something that you should um, discuss with your sailing partner to figure out what makes sense for you. Um, it may not seem like it's necessary for like a, our boat's a 44 foot long boat, um, but you'd be surprised how difficult it is to hear um, when you've got, if you're at the helm and you got the engine running and you're looking for other things around, boats around to make sure you know what's going on and then also trying to hear what your partner's saying 40 or 50 feet up, up ahead of you. And especially if you've got a Dodger or a Bimini around that muffles the sound. Um, and then likewise for the person up on the bow working the anchor, if they're running the windlass, you've got all this clanking and chain sound and it's very hard for you to hear uh, what the person back at the helm might be saying to you. So um, we have some hand signals that we use for the person up on the bow to signal back to the person at the helm what to do. 
whether to go forward, to go in reverse, to go in neutral, um, to go port or starboard. Um, and this is really helpful. We usually use the hand signals in addition to um, voice signals so that like um, I might say go forward and I'll signal going forward and so the person back in the helm knows that they hear my voice they know I've said something and they may have heard it but they can get confirmation with the hand signal as well so both are really helpful not just a hand signal because if you're back at the helm you might be looking around somewhere else and all of a sudden the person's giving you a hand signal you don't know it so the voice and the hand signal together is really helpful so our um, our signals are pretty basic um, but we've got a movement like this, um, which means forward. Um, and then if I go that direction, uh, starboard or port, it means steer that way and forward. Um, this signal is neutral. And this um, upside down helicopter <laughs> is go in reverse. Um, so you can think of the person at the bow as kind of having complete control over the boat when you're, um, in this case, raising the anchor, which we'll do in a minute. So you're in complete control about where the boat should be going because you can see where the chain is and where the anchor, uh, where it's leading down to the anchor. So you'll see us doing that signaling and um, it's important that you develop your own techniques with your sailing partner. The other option is to get uh, hand uh, headsets. And these are really nice. We haven't tried them. Um, definitely on a bigger boat, it would help a lot. I see it also on power boats where you get somebody up and the bridge you can't they're given their position it's hard for them to really see um, hand signals so having headsets is nice too uh, but we're going for the low tech uh, no worry about dead battery solution of doing hand signals okay so let's see this in action Are you ready okay forward neutral Uh, you saw I, really, I didn't need to use the reverse signaling. <clears throat> um, we were okay, but sometimes if you get too much momentum going um, and you overrun where the chain is, you need the person to go in reverse. Or if there's tide or wind pushing you a direction that is too far beyond the chain, you want to make sure you signal to the helms person to go in reverse so that you can get the chain back to having right up right above the windlass. The other hand signal we occasionally use is just a, a single kind of arm, right or left, port or starboard, um, just meaning to steer that way, not to motor that way. So if there's already way on or momentum with the boat, but you, you don't want to get it going any faster, you just want the person to steer one way, we hold our arm out one side or the other as opposed to an active motion with your hand, of meaning to drive the boat that direction. So those are the signals, pretty basic. Um, you don't need to be complicated, but you want to agree with your, um, your crew in terms of what those signals are. <clears throat> the other advice I would have is to change roles. Um, so um, I'm up on the windlass quite a bit, but, and Karen's usually back on the helm, uh, but it's good to switch. So you get to kind of know um, and understand when you're at the helm, you understand a little more what it's like to be at the windlass and, and, and anchoring or pulling up the anchor. Um, and vice versa, so those are important things to do. Um, there's not as much signaling needed when you're dropping the anchor. It's usually more, um, well, it's kind of a collective decision between, I think, the person on the bow and the person at the helm. Um, but it's usually the person at the helm, in our case, knows more about the depth of the water and they can see the chart. So they're kind of more making the primary decision about where to anchor. The person on the bow is there to help to look if the water's clear enough to see if, um, the uh, water's deep enough. Also, you have a much better visibility in terms of other boats, and you get a little bit better perspective, I feel like, than you do when you're back there under the bimini and the dodger, you're more protected. Um, you don't quite get the full feeling of, of proximity or distance to other boats. So we like to use both, both roles. Um, I'll let Karen make the final decision in terms of where to anchor, um, but I'll help her out if I'm up on the bow and vice versa. Um, so both roles are important. So Okay, it's time for a quick review. We talked about posting a bow watch, driving a swing circle around the area you want to anchor, anchoring plenty far up wind of other boats and staggered, giving a minimum of two boat lengths away from your neighboring boats, and understanding how power boats swing differently than sailboats in wind and current, using a stern anchor, but only if others are too, 
being aware of buoys and debris in the area and swimming on your anchor if necessary. And if it's just too crowded, leave, find a place safely away from others. We talked about reading the colors of the water, looking for that light green for sand, and finally, agreeing on a set of hand signals with your sailing partner. Okay, that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this video on anchor positioning and communication. Please consider giving us a thumbs up. It helps us out a lot and it encourages us to do more videos like this. And it also makes it easier for others to find this kind of content. We also enjoy reading your comments and suggestions, so please be sure to leave those below. Take care and fair winds.